Right. Now armed with a rifle, a convicted killer is being cornered bit by bit in Pennsylvania as authorities in tactical gear comb through areas in search of the man who's now been on the run for nearly two weeks. Late developments on the manhunt. Plus... Fue terrible verlas partir porque fue yo el que me alejaron. Yo no quería irme y, y nada. Lloré como nunca. They made the treacherous journey from Colombia with their 10-year-old daughter for a better future for their little girl, but were then quickly separated and bused thousands of miles away. In tonight's Prime Focus, we bring you the exclusive story of reunification against all odds and how one family made it through as thousands of others remain left behind. And from breaking down science and stars for the public to teaching it to the masses, Neil deGrasse Tyson is here to break down galaxies that are truly out of this world. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're following those stories and much more, including the major news from Capitol Hill as House Speaker Kevin McCarthy signals his willingness to allow for a vote that could kickstart impeachment proceedings against President Biden. Plus, the United Auto Workers Union could walk off the job and strike for the first time in more than two decades, causing a ripple effect nationwide. What they're demanding, plus the sentiment among top auto manufacturers with the CEO of Ford, Jim Farley, joining us as the clock kick clicks down to that potential strike. And after a huge off-season announcement that celebrated his move from Green Bay to New York, Aaron Rodgers finally took to the field as a Jet, his time ending just as quickly as it started. We have all the details around that terrible injury and what Rodgers still stands to gain when we go by the numbers. Our correspondents are fanned out across the country covering those stories and much more for us tonight. But we begin with a scary and dangerous development in the search for that escaped convicted murderer in Pennsylvania. Tonight, police say Danilo Calvacante is now armed with a 22 caliber rifle with a scope, and they are warning he is desperate enough to use it. A homeowner opened fire on him, but then he got away again. The search for Cavalcante is now massive, with hundreds pitching in. Teams are out on foot and on horseback about 25 miles north of the prison. Nearby schools are closed, and tonight families are being warned to stay inside and lock their windows and doors. It was 12 days ago that he made that daring escape crab walking up the walls of a passageway onto the roof through barbed wire to get away. Tonight, police insist they will catch him soon. Trevor Alt leads us off once again tonight from the search perimeter. Tonight, authorities say escape murderer Danilo Cavalcante, already considered extremely dangerous, now has a weapon. He is now armed with a 22 caliber rifle with a scope and flashlight mounted on it. I would suspect that he's desperate enough to use that weapon. Police say he stole that rifle overnight from the garage of a home near East Nantmeal Township, encountering the homeowner face to face. And I believe it was a crime of opportunity. I think he went in there try probably trying to hide. The garage door was open. He didn't, uh, I, I believe, uh, recognize that the owner was in there. That homeowner drawing a pistol and firing multiple shots, but Cavalcante got away unscathed. His sweatshirt and T-shirt found near the driveway. Actor description, Hispanic male, roughly 30 years of age, 5 foot, currently shirtless and blue pants. Subjects known to have a 22 cutoff rifle with a scope and a flashlight. Authorities say that confrontation was one of multiple sightings Monday. A few hours prior, a driver reported seeing Cavalcante crouched on the side of the road close to where he abandoned this stolen van over the weekend. Can you loop back around, go up the Fairview Road? We got a possible sighting. The possible sighting of the male flight going back into the woods. A tactical team was there within minutes, finding footprints and his prison shoes, but not Cavalcante. And a pair of work boots were later reported stolen. Today, nearby schools closed with armed search teams swarming the dense terrain by foot and on horseback. At this point, I believe he is beyond assistance and he is in that perimeter and we will actively hunt until we find him. Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro urging residents to remain vigilant. Are you confident they'll be able to catch him soon? I'm absolutely confident. Perhaps that's some reassurance to the community there. Trevor Alt joins us now. Trevor, do authorities think that they have an idea of where he is right now? Well, they believe they have a general idea, Lindsay. What they say is after that homeowner opened fire last night, that officers were on the scene within minutes. And while Cavalcante was likely uninjured, they don't think he got very far. So now they're pouring even more resources into the area. There's upwards of 500 law enforcement officers here on the ground trying to secure his capture. Lindsay? Trevor Alt for us in Chester County. Thanks, Trevor. 
We turn now to Washington, where House Speaker Kevin McCarthy says he is officially opening an impeachment inquiry into President Biden, saying it will give committees, quote, full power to gather all the facts about whether the president benefited from the business dealings of his son, Hunter. The White House is calling it extreme politics at its worst. ABC senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott. Tonight, under pressure from House Republicans, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy back, opening everyone. an impeachment inquiry into President Biden, investigating whether he benefited from the business dealings of his son, Hunter. House Republicans have uncovered serious and credible allegations into President Biden's conduct. Taken together, these allegations paint a picture of a culture of corruption. Less than two weeks ago, McCarthy said he would not launch an inquiry unless the full House voted for one, saying it should not happen through a declaration by one person. But after far-right Republicans threatened to boot him as Speaker and former President Donald Trump turned the screws, McCarthy changed his tune, launching an impeachment probe while conceding he has no evidence President Biden committed high crimes and misdemeanors. Oh, Do you believe there's an impeachable offense that President Biden has committed? Keep moving, guys. Got to keep moving. All I said is keep moving. Stay outside. 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 House Republicans have already spent nine months investigating whether, as vice president, Joe Biden made decisions to help his son and enrich himself. But they've come up empty. Have you seen any hard evidence that President Biden did any wrongdoing here? Two months. We are uh, developing that, and that's why the inquiry has to happen. Over in the Senate, Republican leader Mitch McConnell keeping the House inquiry at arm's length. I don't think Leader McCarthy, Speaker McCarthy, needs any advice from the Senate on how to run the House. But even some Republicans are saying the evidence against the president is just not there. And from Democrats tonight, outrage. This is an illegitimate impeachment inquiry, period, full stop. It's a waste of time and taxpayer dollars. And the White House tonight attacking McCarthy's move as extreme politics at its worst, adding the president hasn't done anything wrong. Rachel Scott joins us now from the Capitol. Rachel, Speaker McCarthy is clearly moving forward with this impeachment inquiry, but are any Republicans concerned it could backfire? Yeah, Lindsay. Well, clearly with his speakership on the line, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is trying to satisfy the far right wing of his party. But when you talk to moderates, they are sounding the alarm. They are saying that they are concerned about moving forward with this impeachment inquiry, especially as we head into a critical election year, insisting Republican voters want them to be focused on key issues like the economy and inflation, not this. Lindsay. Rachel Scott for us from the Capitol. Thanks, Rachel. Tonight, there is a humanitarian crisis unfolding in Libya after a major storm unleashed devastating floodwaters. Roughly 5,000 people are feared dead, 10,000 more still unaccounted for. In the coastal city of Derna, the rushing water destroyed two dams, gouging a valley where neighborhoods once stood. And tonight, the need for help is growing. ABC's chief foreign correspondent Ian Panel reports. Tonight, catastrophe in Libya. A major storm triggering a flooding disaster, breaking two dams and sweeping away thousands of lives. Officials fear upwards of 5,000 people are dead, with as many as 10,000 still missing. Bodies lining the streets, survivors left with nothing. A quarter of the eastern city of Derna wiped off the map. A Mediterranean storm lashing the coastal city with 16 inches of rain in a 24-hour period. Residents reported sounds like explosions as the massive dams gave way. There used to be a dam, this man says. Now it's soil. Derna City pleading for help. It's taken hours for rescue teams and the military to get on the ground. Conflict and a crumbling infrastructure hampering rescue operations, with Libya divided by two competing governments. As limited international aid arrives, the true scale of this disaster still unknown. Lindsay, climate change a potential aggravating factor here. The UN saying that rising sea levels are leaving Libya's low-lying coastline more vulnerable to flooding. The US now joining other nations in sending critical aid to the stricken area. Lindsay, 
Ian, thank you. Not far away in Morocco, the death toll from that 6.8 magnitude earthquake has now risen to at least 2,900. Take a look at the images of the devastation in the mountain towns near the epicenter. The military is using helicopters to provide aid. But still, rescue teams from a number of countries, including the U.S., are standing by waiting to be allowed to help. Tom Sufi Burge is on the scene for us in Morocco. Tonight, terrifying video of the moment that powerful 6.8 magnitude earthquake rocked Morocco. A joyous wedding celebration late Friday night. Cut short by violent shaking. The crowd screaming in horror. With more than 2,900 lives lost, this is now mostly a mission to recover the dead. New drone video showing the destruction near the epicenter in the high Atlas Mountains. Helicopters evacuating injured survivors. Rescuers loading patients on stretchers. A small child taken on board. Helicopters is the only way to get into the most remote communities. And they're clearing rocks off the road. Tens of thousands homeless. Mustafa smiling and strong <laughs> for his three young children. We just need a big help right this now. time. Right this now. time and now. They need help, and there are offers for help. Tom Sufi Burge joins us now from Morocco. Tom, what's the latest on the efforts by the international community to provide aid in Morocco? Lindsay, we've seen a fair amount of aid arriving into these mountains. We saw Spanish rescue workers today. But Morocco's still not accepting an offer of assistance from the United States. But coordinating the entire relief effort into these remote areas is complex. Lindsay? would imagine so. Tom Sufi Burridge, our thanks to you. A new storm is triggering flood alerts in the northeast from D.C. to New York all the way up to Boston. It follows a flash flooding emergency in Leominster, Massachusetts, where there were more than nine inches of rain in just a few hours. Hurricane Lee is now a major Category 3 storm. Lee's possible track, those spaghetti models, show it heading north and could make landfall in Maine or near the Canadian border this weekend. ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it all for us. Hey, Rob. Hi, Lindsay. Uh, lots of weather uh, to impact potentially the northeast here. We had a dry day, finally, but flood watches are back up for eastern and central Massachusetts, even southern parts of New Hampshire. So from Boston uh, back to nearly Baltimore, those watches are up till Thursday morning because that front you see slicing across Pennsylvania, that one's strong enough to push through. And as it does so tonight and tomorrow morning from D.C. up by 94, 5 and New York and New Haven and eventually towards Providence, we could see strong to severe thunderstorms throughout the day, and those could dump more in the way of some heavy rain. All right, after that, we're looking at Hurricane Lee, which is growing in size. It's a hundred or about 500 miles south of uh, Bermuda. It's got Category 3 force winds. It's forecast to be past Bermuda on Thursday as a Cat 2, as it does so, churning up water there and along the east coast of the U.S. going to have rip currents and dangerous surf there through the week into the weekend and over the weekend, likely on Saturday, we're looking for a landfall potentially in anywhere from Portland, Maine, through Bar Harbor to Halifax to the eastern edge of Nova Scotia as potentially a Category 1 storm. But even whether or not it's a hurricane or not, it still has a massive wind field that will extend west into the U.S. So I think millions of folks along the New England coast are going to be impacted by Lee before we're done with it. Lindsay? Rob Marciano, our thanks to you as always. The University of Alabama has condemned a viral video that shows their fans hurling racist and homophobic language at Texas players following a weekend game. Footage shows Crimson Tide fans shouting insults at two Longhorns defensive backs as well as a running back after their 34-24 victory. In a statement, UA says that they are disgusted by the video and that that behavior will not be tolerated. Five former Memphis police officers accused of second-degree murder in the beating death of Tyree Nichols during a traffic stop last January are now being charged with federal civil rights violations in that assault. Let's bring in ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas. Pierre, explain these charges and what the Justice Department is alleging here. Lindsay, the allegations being made by the Justice Department are deeply disturbing. Five former Memphis police detectives are accused of violating the civil rights of Tyree Nichols by beating him to the point of unconsciousness and ultimately to death. They are accused of ignoring his critical injuries and of failing to report that he had been severely beaten to the paramedics and police survivors arriving at the scene. And DOJ claims that the detectives sought to cover up what they'd done by altering police body cameras and filing false and misleading police reports. Lindsay, these are the most serious charges DOJ can bring in such cases, and these officers could face life in prison if convicted. Lindsay.
All right, Pierre Thomas, our thanks to you. About 146,000 auto workers are getting ready to strike this week if their demands are not met by General Motors, Ford, and Stellantis. The union is threatening a walkout in multiple states if they do not reach an agreement on higher wages and benefits with the companies. Their deadline is midnight Eastern time on Thursday. If the strike shuts down production, it could cause a spike in vehicle prices and a shortage of American-made cars in as soon as two months. For the latest on the talks with the big three automakers ahead of a potential UAW strike, we're joined now by Ford CEO Jim Farley. Thank you so much, Mr. Farley, for joining us. Uh, we'll get to the talks in a moment, but first, Ford will be unveiling the 2024 Ford F-150 tonight ahead of the Detroit Auto Show. Tell us a bit about that and, and what it means for your company. Well, the F-150 is the most popular vehicle in America for 41 years and the most popular truck for 46 years. On revenue alone, it's, a, it's larger than the entire size of Starbucks or Netflix. So it's a huge business for not just Ford, but our economy. Uh, I think we're gonna end the tailgate uh, wars with a very creative solution. Uh, our hybrid F-150 uh, can power your house for seven days and get better fuel economy too. Uh, so we have a lot of new technology. Sounds impressive and very exciting, but I would have to imagine that a lot of your attention at this particular moment is on this potential strike. Just break down for us where things stand at this hour on the negotiations between the UAW and Ford. Are, are you any closer to reaching a deal? We're really in, in the heart of the negotiations now. We're less than, we're about 48 hours until our contract expires, so just about two days. Uh, this is really negotiations for the future of automotive manufacturing in the U.S. Uh, we are putting forth a, an offer uh, today that's uh, the, the most lucrative offer in 80 years working with the UAW. Large pay increases, top 1% health care. We're gonna be, uh, we have profit sharing. We're gonna be uh, adding uh, inflation protection. We're gonna be getting rid of all the tiered labor. Uh, they, our, our team gets five weeks of vacation. They get another 17 days off, a lot, lot in the offer, but this will be a very, the most lucrative offer and will require a lot of belt tightening at the company. And there's a limit how far we can go because we have to keep investing for the transition of the industry. We are very optimistic that we can reach an agreement with the UAW in the next two days. Um, and it's very important for the country. Uh, you mentioned that 48 hour deadline. Bottom line, how confident are you that you can avoid a strike between the UAW and Ford before the end of the week? Well, rhetoric aside, um, it's time for us to come together. And we put in our first offer a couple weeks ago and uh, we still haven't found the right deal for both sides, but we're still confident that we can reach a deal because it is so important for the U.S. economy and for our country uh, and for, of course, those 57,000 workers. Um, we're the most committed to the UAW, so um, it's critical that we find a deal, but there is a limit, as I said. We're not gonna mortgage our future. And what about the union demand on reinstatement of pensions for new workers or their calls for a four day, 32 hour work week? Are either of those still on the table? I think they are from the UEW standpoint, but we, we can't have a sustainable industry working four days a week. Look, we've been very profitable as a company. We're returning from profitable. We didn't go bankrupt. Many of our competitors did. And, and now we've built this very competitive, profitable company. We have more work to do on that, by the way, on cost and quality. Um, and, and we want everyone to benefit from that. But, but we also have to invest in this huge transition to electric, partial electric future, $50 billion in Ford's case, and we need the profitability to invest. According to SEC filings, you received nearly $21 million in total compensation in 2022. In comparison, the median total compensation for Ford employees was about $75,000. That's a 281 to one ratio. Do you think that that gap should change? Well, I think, first of all, my job is to add value to the company and to make sure all of our workforce is handsomely awarded, that we all benefit in growth. Um, and yes, that's, you know, all, at all levels of the company, you know, we have to be competitive. But my goal 
is just totally focused on making sure we have a vibrant future for everyone, especially our factory workers. My grandfather was an hourly worker for Ford, and we want to make sure everyone has a future, but we have to be competitive. And talk about the potential cost to your company and to the American consumers if a strike does go forward. What kind of impact could that have? It would be devastating. Our supply base still hasn't recovered from COVID. Uh, we have a lot of vulnerable suppliers still. We have so many communities that depend on Ford in, in Michigan and Ohio and, and all over the upper Midwest. Um, so this is, has a huge impact. You know, uh, any kind of significant outage would. Ford has not been on strike since the mid-70s. Uh, we've always worked through this, and that's why we committed to to the UAW. The, the, the impacts of a strike, especially a long, uh, ongoing strike, multi-week, multi-month strike, would be devastating for the U.S. economy. Ford President and CEO Jim Farley, we thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you coming on the show tonight. Thank you, Lindsay. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has endorsed updated COVID shots for everyone aged six months and older. The vaccines from Moderna, Pfizer, and its partner BioNTech will be available by the end of the week. The U.S. has seen a surge in COVID hospitalizations this summer as new variants emerge with hundreds of people still dying each week. The new shot will be available at pharmacies and some doctor's offices and will be mostly free through private insurance, Medicare, or Medicaid. And we still have much more to get to here on Prime tonight. Officials say they caught a brazen theft on camera and accused TSA agents of being the culprits. What they say was stolen from someone's belongings at a security checkpoint. But next in our Prime Focus, families separated at the border. It's still happening. And one family tells us how they were not only separated, but some were then bust hundreds of miles away. Nos cortaron las bandas y a él se lo llevan. No me dieron explicación y yo pregunté que para dónde lo llevaba. Ellos la única respuesta que me dieron que aquí eran las leyes. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wiener Mobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back, everyone. It's become one of the darkest realities for some migrants seeking the American dream, family separation. While the policy of separating families no longer exists, the practice continues under the watch of the Biden administration. In tonight's Prime Focus, we bring you the exclusive story of one family who was not only separated, but then bussed across the country, eventually reunited after multiple days apart. Here's ABC's Ariel Reshef. <laughs> stands at LAX airport. 
anxiously awaiting the arrival of her husband, John. Nos cortaron las bandas y a él se lo llevan. No me dieron explicación. Yo pregunté que para dónde lo llevaba. Ellos la única respuesta que me dieron que aquí eran las leyes. Mi sueño era pasar los tres. Entonces sí tenía como ese miedo. Eh, pero le pedía mucho a Dios para que hubiera una manera de, de que hubiera un milagro. Weeks of anguish and anticipation. Turn to relief. Sorry, sorry. Ambar and John were finally able to reunite after being separated for 17 days by Customs and Border Patrol at the Texas border with Mexico. The couple making the treacherous journey from Colombia with their 10-year-old daughter, Aranza. Like many, they left everything behind in their home countries, fleeing what they tell us were unsafe conditions, all for a better future for their little girl. What was it like to be with your 10-year-old daughter on such a strenuous journey? Traumatic. La verdad fue una decisión riesgosa, sabíamos, y aparte que tenemos alguien que hay que cuidar, que es la niña. Entonces, pues con mi familia no tuvimos otra opción. When you saw the border and you knew that you had gotten to the United States, what was your first feeling? Ya era, ya el sueño era menos lejos, ya no estaba tan lejos porque ya estábamos ahí, estábamos pisando ya el suelo americano. Upon arrival, Customs and Border Patrol initially classified Ambar, John and Aranza as a family unit. Nosotros le dijimos que teníamos una carta de concubinato de Colombia legal. Nos entregaron unas bandas y nos separaron del grupo con el que veníamos. En ese momento nadie nos dio explicación. Lo único que me preguntaron que si todo lo que estaba en la bolsa que siempre nos entregan para las pertenencias, si todo era de él, si todo era de él y me insistían que si no había nada de mí. Y yo dije, no, es todo de él. En ese momento eh, nos cortaron las, las bandas y a él se lo llevan. So they didn't believe that your documentation about your marriage was valid. And what was your feeling at that moment? Para mí fue terrible verlas partir porque fue yo el que me alejaron. Yo no quería irme y, y nada, lloré como nunca. John was taken to a detention center. Ambar left alone with her daughter and no money. She wondered what she would do until someone at the shelter in McAllen offered her and Aranza seats on a bus carrying 41 other migrants. It was headed straight to Los Angeles and left with no other option, she got on. Cousins and Border Protection has continued to separate families where they question the validity of a relationship or, you know, they send adult males to detention centers in the United States. Reports of Customs and Border Patrol separating families at the border date back to 2017 under the Trump administration as part of a policy of splitting up children from their parent or guardian at the border. And while the Biden administration did away with that mandated separation, Cargioli says for some families like John and Ambar's who arrive in Texas, it's still happening. A DHS spokesperson tells ABC News this report is troubling. We can both enforce our laws and treat human beings with dignity. Unlawful border crossings have gone down since our border enforcement plan went into effect. Managing our border in a safe and humane way works best when we all work together to respect the dignity of every human being and keep our communities safe. What were you telling your daughter during those hours on the bus? Pues me tocó decirle como en varias ocasiones eh, que durmiera porque primero tenía hambre y segundo estaba mareada, ¿verdad? Y tenía ganas de ir al baño. Y en esas tres ocasiones, como tú le explicas a un niño, no, no puedes. Lo único que le decía que durmiera, que tuviéramos paciencia porque yo no podía dormir porque tenía que estar pendiente de ella. What did you know about the United States? What did your parents tell you about coming to the United States? Ay, había como el que se llama Mm. Un parque. Un parque, ¿cómo es que se llama? Disney World. <laughs> Disney World? You told her about Disney World. It's a very important piece of American culture. 
Unbeknownst to Ambar, the long bus ride to L.A. was part of a policy instated by Texas Governor Greg Abbott just over a year ago. His state transporting more than 30,000 migrants so far from Texas to Democrat-led cities across the country. Yo, la verdad, pues... No sabía nada de eso. Lo único que fue que yo donde llegué, pues me ofrecieron un bus gratuito. According to CBP, 92,454 encounters between migrants and border patrol agents happened in July alone at the Texas-Mexico border. Governor Abbott claims these actions provide needed relief to overwhelmed border communities. But his policies have faced sharp scrutiny from humanitarian organizations and advocates like Cargioli. Governor Abbott's policy is causing real harm to real individuals. While Democrat-run cities welcomed migrants at first, receiving them from those Texas buses and trying to provide resources, they too are now feeling the strain of the influx. The mayors of New York City, Denver, Philadelphia and Los Angeles are all calling on the Biden administration to grant critical federal assistance. I don't see an ending to this. This issue will destroy New York City. We're calling on the Biden administration to provide funding and logistical support we need. We've had more buses show up in the last 15, 15 weeks than all of last year combined. Governor Abbott has clearly instated policies, but there are states and cities that have been more friendly to migrants that are sounding the alarm, saying they simply don't have the capacity to take any more, New York being one of them. How concerning is that for someone like you? It is not true that New York City does not have the capacity to assist more asylum seekers. It's a matter of working with the community and community members and organizations that are able to assist. It's, it's a matter of expanding federal policies that will uh, help better assimilate asylum seekers in need into our communities, cities, and states. Last month, the White House granted $77 million in congressional funding for communities receiving migrants. But some say money alone won't mitigate the crisis. Making matters more complicated for families like Ambar and John, who are seeking asylum, the Biden administration has imposed new asylum restrictions on some who cross into the U.S. from the Mexico border. A similar policy was struck down during the Trump years. Why do you think there's still an asylum ban? The asylum ban is an unfortunate measure that the Biden administration implemented, uh, we believe, because of, you know, continuing to have to respond to the xenophobic rhetoric that we're seeing um, by many politicians in the United States. But the this is a Democratic ban, administration that has put an asylum ban in place. The Biden administration has not opened the border uh, as we've known it prior to the Trump administration. They've continued to use restrictive measures. Clinging to her faith, Ambar was finally able to contact her husband through a nonprofit organization after eight long days without any communication. John was finally released from Port Isabel Detention Center in Texas and flown by an immigrant advocacy group to reunite with his family. They are now living in New York, taking on their next chapter, hoping to be granted the chance to stay and build a life here in the U.S. Este país nos dé la oportunidad de demostrar que merecemos estar acá. Venimos aquí a trabajar, a cumplir con todo lo que sea necesario para poder permanecer acá el tiempo que Dios lo permite. And as for Aranza, she's already aspiring to do great things. What do you dream about? Ser abogada. Ah, you want to be a lawyer. Porque ayudas a las personas. Quite an admirable dream. Our thanks to Ariel for bringing us that. So much more to get to tonight coming up. Your go-to decongestant may not be getting the job done. What the FDA is now saying about the effectiveness of a commonly used ingredient. The next Super Bowl hopes are put in jeopardy for Jets fans within a matter of minutes. We take a look at Aaron Rodgers' injury by the numbers. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. 
This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the Year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes. Escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This this is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. What You Need to Know, a third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that. Me. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. Boy, was it a stunning turn of events when quarterback Aaron Rodgers went down injured in his first game for the New York Jets last night. Let's take a look at what it means for Rodgers and the Jets by the numbers. Just four plays into his regular season Jets debut on Monday Night Football, Rodgers appeared to catch his foot on the turf as he tried to spin out of a tackle. An MRI today confirmed that the 39-year-old tore his Achilles tendon on the play, ending a season that had Super Bowl hopes. That means his season will end with just one incomplete pass to his credit as a Jet, and he will not return to the field this season. Rodgers had been traded this offseason from the Green Bay Packers, where he was a four-time MVP with one Super Bowl win. He signed a three-year, $112.5 million contract with the Jets with $75 million of that fully guaranteed for the next two seasons. Rodgers turns 40 in December, leaving questions about whether he'll continue his career. But even with the injury, he'll have plenty of money to fall back on. He's earned $342.5 million in NFL contracts since 2005, the highest amount in NFL history. And the only silver lining for the Jets last night well they did win the game 22 to 16 in overtime with a 65 yard punt return touchdown sealing the win over buffalo 
and we still have much more ahead on Prime tonight. A painting worth millions is found after being stolen from someone's home. How this Van Gogh was returned after years of searching. And it could be this family's lucky day. How their daughter's birth dates are proving good things really do come in threes. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward first choice. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Former officers are indicted on federal charges in the death of a black man. Video allegedly shows TSA agents stealing from passengers and how an art detective tracked down a stolen painting worth millions. These stories are much more in tonight's rundown. Five fired Memphis police officers already facing criminal charges in the death of Tyree Nichols, now indicted on federal civil rights charges. The January beating death of Tyree Nichols after a traffic stop in Memphis strengthened nationwide calls for police reform and led to the deactivation of the Memphis Police Department's Scorpion Unit, credited with crime suppression but feared for its aggressive, even violent tactics. The federal indictment charges each of the officers with deprivation of rights under the color of law through excessive force and through deliberate indifference. The same five officers have pleaded not guilty to state charges of second-degree murder. 
Three TSA agents arrested by police earlier this summer accused of stealing from passengers at Miami International Airport. Prosecutors are releasing new surveillance video allegedly showing the agents in action. The footage, recorded back on June 29th, appears to show one agent reaching inside a small bag to pull out a passenger's wallet. In another clip, the same agent is joined by a colleague, the pair appearing to focus on the corner of a bag when one of them quickly pockets something, which according to police turned out to be $600 in cash. An FDA panel rejecting the effectiveness of the most popular nasal decongestant on the market. Government health officials say phenylephrine offers no relief from congestion. That ingredient is used in major drugstore brands, including forms of Sudafed, Dayquil, and Allegra. The FDA finding that only a very small amount of the drug reaches the nasal passage when taken orally. The agency may now order drug makers to pull products containing the ingredient from store shelves. Elves. A stolen Van Gogh painting worth millions has been recovered, returned in an IKEA bag to a private detective hired to investigate its disappearance. The painting is estimated to be worth between three and six million dollars and was painted by the legendary artist in 1884. In 2020, it was stolen from a museum in the Netherlands in a daring heist caught on camera. The museum saying there's some new damage on the painting, but after restoration is complete, it will be on display once again. Bad Bunny gracing the cover of Vanity Fair for their October issue. The megastar, who is rumored to have an album out this fall, didn't confirm or deny it, but did say he's been inspired by music in both English and Spanish from the 70s. He also gave his thoughts on losing the Grammy for Album of the Year. He said maybe the Academy wasn't ready for a Spanish-language album to win the big prize. When asked about his relationship with Kendall Jenner, the artist simply said he had no interest in clarifying anything to anyone. September 3 is a special day for us. Newborn Juliet Turner will blow out the same candles as her sisters, Jasmine and Jessica, who are all born on the same day. It was like deja vu all over again, the same thing. And everybody was shocked and surprised. They couldn't even believe it. Turner was pregnant with her second daughter, Jessica. Her due date was close to her first daughter, Jasmine's birthday. But they never imagined Jessica would arrive September 3rd. And then came Juliet. For the Turners, all good things come in threes and on the 3rd of September. He's dubbed it the war on wokeness. Florida governor and presidential hopeful Ron DeSantis has worked aggressively to restrict race-related content in workplaces, schools, and colleges. But some educators and parents are fighting back to make sure their history and the sacrifices and brutalities endured by their ancestors are not erased from American history. Here's ABC's Victor Akendo. The new school year is underway in Florida with controversy in the classroom. DeSantis is trying to wipe out our history. Worse than that, he's trying to rewrite it. What will you do when your child comes home and tells you, my teacher says slaves got benefits from being enslaved. My teacher told me that. This recent march, organized by Marvin Dunn, co-founder of the Miami Center for Racial Justice, included teachers, parents, and students fighting against Florida's curriculum changes in education, specifically black history. In your opinion, what is the state of education here in Florida? It's a disaster. And how do you fix this disaster, as you called it? We stand up. To me, we're back in the 1960s. We're back in 63, 64. We need to peaceably take to the streets. We need to be heard on the streets in a peaceful way to let America know that this is not right and we're not going to stand for it. What were you hoping to accomplish by speaking out? I was hoping that our school board would say to the state of Florida, we're not going to teach our children in Miami-Dade County that slavery had benefits to black people, to, to the enslaved people. We want our school board to reject this. Florida's new curriculum includes instruction for middle school students that slaves develop skills which in some instances can be applied for their personal benefit. Governor Ron DeSantis defending the new curriculum while on his presidential campaign. They're probably going to show some of the folks that eventually parlayed, uh, you know, being a blacksmith into, into doing things later, later in life. That's mean. That's mean to say that to black people, that there was some advantage, some, some positive benefit to being enslaved. 
they weren't even considered to be persons. So how could they have personal benefits? Following Florida's educational rollbacks, Joanna Jones, a middle school teacher in Miami and mother of two students, questions the future of her children's education. I'm concerned as a parent about what my kids are being taught. Are they being taught the truth or are they just being taught something just to pass them along? What do you think should be taught in middle school about slavery? Considering that it's middle school, I do believe that kids should know the truth about how this nation came about. And then they can form their own opinions afterwards. There's a level of trauma. And I do believe that everyone should know the truth. In middle school, high school, we can't change it if we refuse to acknowledge it. In an effort to teach black history, Dunn leads Teach the Truth tours at historical sites in Florida. Why is it so important to go visit these historical sites? People need to walk the blooded ground. People need to walk in the places where these things happen so that they become meaningful to them, so that you carry the experience beyond just the academic. History is not just facts. If you only teach history as facts, you're really teaching a catalog, not really emotion. So to go to places where these things have happened is transformational for a lot of people, and that's why we do it. The tour includes Rosewood, Florida, where an African-American community once prospered until a white mob destroyed it in the 1923 Rosewood Massacre. Jones went on one of these tours. I get a little emotional because knowing that it was sacred grounds, knowing that people were running for their lives, it's still very emotional for me, and I'm still processing the whole thing. And there's a level of trauma, and I do believe that Everyone should know the truth. At its core, why is knowing and understanding history so important? We are not that far away from being in another period of anti-race violence in our country. It's important to know history, to not repeat history. I don't think human nature is so reliable that we can depend on not sliding back into some of these very evil, mean things that we have had happen in our country. And how this subject is taught can alter both our nation's history and future. So what needs to be changed here? How do you fix this? Hmm. You fix it with the truth. That simple? It's just that simple. And if this nation is gonna be great, if this state is gonna be great, we have to look each other in the mirror, accept ourselves for who we are, accept this nation for where it came from. If we're willing to do that, then we might be one nation under God. Our thanks to Victor Rakendo. After making the comments about slavery, Governor DeSantis further clarified his stance on curriculum changes and said slavery wasn't a benefit. Rather, quote, there was resourcefulness and people acquired skills in spite of slavery, not because of it. And speaking of the truth, our next guest is no stranger to this show or to space. Astrophysicist Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson has dedicated his life and career to learning about the cosmos and teaching it. From communicating science and the stars to the public, Tyson's breakdown of the galaxies are truly out of this world. His new book, To Infinity and Beyond, dives into the mysteries of the solar system and the limitless bounds of space, taking readers on a journey to learning not only the Earth's atmosphere, but the galaxies far outside our reach. And joining us now is none other than Mr. Tyson himself. Hello. Great to have Thanks you here, Thanks for having Neil. me back. Thanks of for your course, interest. Of course, always yeah. a pleasure. You know, the universe always calls to everyone, so. Uh, I, I, I it must have called you. to you. It summoned, yes. <laughs> it summoned and me you answered. We from the ether. That. I was delighted. You know, for us ordinary Earthlings, uh, the amount that we know about space is really often limited, really, to what we see in Hollywood. Yeah. How do you feel that those depictions often miss the mark? So, uh, good that you ask that, because this, this treatise, a treatise that overstates it, this is an, an account of humans' attempt to, you're here on Earth, and you say, well, how would you ever reach the moon mm -hmm. if you didn't have science? This, this is like a completely out of reach concept. And then you say, well, okay, we're now we're in space. How do, we, how do we go farther? How would you visit the stars? How would you visit the galaxies? Either physically or intellectually. There's a wormhole there. We saw an image of one. That'd be good if we had wormholes. We don't. So as we go on this journey of the mind and body, 
Uh, the DNA of this book tracks from my podcast, which is called Star Talk, which is the mixture of science, pop culture, and humor. And what we find is that when we deliver science that way, people come back for more. Mm. So as you learn this journey of how we ascended from Earth to reach the stars, there are movies that also touch those themes. So we take a, a, a quick, it's not so much an off ramp, but it's the scenery that passes you, where you learn about how movies get some stuff right and other movies get it wrong. And that's the pop culture dimension of this book. And, and you have a lot of cultural references, photos, art. Oh, yes. The book was produced by, by National Geographic. So you know it, it's a beautiful book. You have lots of books about space. How is this one different? This one's different because typically you 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 talk about discoveries. These are great visuals you got here, but it's the Crab Nebula. I love it. How would you visit other stars? If I put you on a ship, you'll get there 50,000 years from now. So the ideas of a generational ship, uh, is that a realistic thing? I think it's sort of uh, philosophically, uh, uh, you, you're committing future generations of unborn to the mission that you started. And in a free country, that doesn't sound right to me. But that's the only way we can imagine visiting, all right? Maybe there's, we'll figure out a wormhole or something in the future. So we track this. And plus, I get on the case. Uh, when we talk about matter and what we do with it. So you and Lindsay Nix Walker go on this journey together. Yes, so, so she is a longtime senior producer of Star Talk. Mm. And so this is a Star Talk collaboration with National Geographic Books. I do want to get in really quickly because a lot of people are talking about artificial intelligence. What does artificial intelligence mean for the future galactic frontier? Oh, well, we've been, I've been, my field, has been using AI as soon as it became available. There's neural nets to help you make decisions, it can make some more creative decisions than you can with vast amounts of data. And by the way, it's not just unique to my field. AI is everywhere. So if people, when ChatGPT came out and it could write your term paper, people lost their minds over that. And I'm thinking, okay, it finally can write your term paper, but it has been doing my work <laughs> ever since we could have it. And it beat us at Go, at Jeopardy, at, at Jeopardy, ABC Pro. Right. Okay. <laughs> uh, go Jeopardy and, and chess. And no one lost their minds from that. We were very impressed it with it. It wasn't until we had to write, we no longer had to write our own Then somehow that now you're worried about it? Okay. So who wrote yeah. this book? That's my oh. question. But we're, we're no, at a time. Chat GPT can't write on on content that it has that, not, that been, that has not been put on the internet. And this, this stuff on there, we put in there. Neil? We always enjoy talking to you. I've only, I think I only got through like, you know, a, a fraction of my questions. Oh, yeah, no, the universe can, is vast. You can yeah. find all the answers to your own questions in his book, To Infinity and Beyond. It is now available wherever books are sold. Thank you, Thank, Thanks for having me. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, new booster shots are coming soon, but are officials sure enough people will get them to keep cases down? We talked to CDC Director Mandy Cohen. And Apple announces its new iPhone along with some major changes. What sets this one apart from the rest? Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me.
This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes. Escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We've got a lot of news to get to this evening, including the intense search for the now armed, convicted killer on the loose in Pennsylvania, the latest developments in the manhunt. Plus, Super Bowl hopes are dashed, potentially put in jeopardy for Jets fans within a matter of minutes. We take a look at Aaron Rodgers' injury and the big payload he's still expected to rake in. And the CDC now recommends new booster shots for anyone six months and older. But will Americans heed their vaccine warning? We'll discuss the new developments with CDC Director Mandy Cohen in just a few minutes. But we do begin with a scary and dangerous development in the search for that escaped convicted murderer in Pennsylvania. Tonight, police say Danilo Cavalcante is now armed with a 22 caliber rifle with a scope. And they are warning he's desperate enough to use it. A homeowner opened fire on him, but he then got away. The search for Cavalcante is massive, with hundreds pitching in. Teams are out on foot and on horseback about 25 miles north of the prison. Nearby schools are closed, and tonight families are being warned to stay inside and lock their windows and doors. It's now been 12 days since he escaped, and tonight police insist they will catch him soon. Trevor Alt leads us off. Tonight, authorities say escape murderer Danilo Cavalcante, already considered extremely dangerous, now has a weapon. He is now armed with a 22 caliber rifle with a scope and flashlight mounted on it. I would suspect that he's desperate enough to use that weapon. Police say he stole that rifle overnight from the garage of a home near East Nantmeal Township, encountering the homeowner face to face. And I believe it was a crime of opportunity. I think he went in there probably trying to hide. The garage door was open. He didn't, uh, I, I believe, uh, recognize that the owner was in there. That homeowner drawing a pistol and firing multiple shots, but Cavalcante got away unscathed. His sweatshirt and T-shirt found near the driveway. Actor description, Hispanic male, roughly 30 years of age, 5 foot, currently shirtless and blue pants. Subjects known to have a 22 cutoff rifle with a scope and a flashlight. Authorities say that confrontation was one of multiple sightings Monday. A few hours prior, a driver reported seeing Cavalcante crouched on the side of the road close to where he abandoned this stolen van over the weekend. You loop back around, go up the Fairview Road, we got a possible sighting. The possible sighting of the male flight going back in the woods. A tactical team was there within minutes, finding footprints and his prison shoes, but not Cavalcante. And a pair of work boots were later reported stolen. 
Today, nearby schools closed with armed search teams swarming the dense terrain by foot and on horseback. At this point, I believe he is beyond assistance and he is in that perimeter and we will actively hunt until we find him. Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro urging residents to remain vigilant. Are you confident they'll be able to catch him soon? I'm absolutely confident. I'm sure people in the community excited to hear the potential of that confidence there are thanks to Trevor. And we turn now to Washington where House Speaker Kevin McCarthy says he is officially opening an impeachment inquiry into President Biden, saying it will give committees, quote, full power to gather all the facts about whether the president benefited from the business dealings of his son, Hunter. The White House is calling it extreme politics at its worst. Here's ABC's senior congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott. Tonight, under pressure from House Republicans, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy back, opening everyone. an impeachment inquiry into President Biden, investigating whether he benefited from the business dealings of his son, Hunter. House Republicans have uncovered serious and credible allegations into President Biden's conduct. Taken together, these allegations paint a picture of a culture of corruption. Less than two weeks ago, McCarthy said he would not launch an inquiry unless the full House voted for one, saying it should not happen through a declaration by one person. But after far-right Republicans threatened to boot him as Speaker and former President Donald Trump turned the screws, McCarthy changed his tune, launching an impeachment probe while conceding he has no evidence President Biden committed high crimes and misdemeanors. Oh, Do you believe there's an impeachable offense that President Biden has committed? Keep moving, guys. Gotta keep moving. All I said is an impeachable inquiry. Stay outside. Stay outside. Stay outside. Stay House Republicans have already spent nine months investigating whether, as vice president, Joe Biden made decisions to help his son and enrich himself. But they've come up empty. Have you seen any hard evidence that President Biden did any wrongdoing here? Two months. We are uh, developing that, and that's why the inquiry has to happen. Over in the Senate, Republican leader Mitch McConnell keeping the House inquiry at arm's length. I don't think Leader McCarthy, Speaker McCarthy, needs any advice from the Senate on how to run the House. But even some Republicans are saying the evidence against the president is just not there. And from Democrats tonight, outrage. This is an illegitimate impeachment inquiry, period, full stop. It's a waste of time and taxpayer dollars. And the White House tonight attacking McCarthy's move as extreme politics at its worst, adding the president hasn't done anything wrong. Our thanks to Rachel. Tonight, there is a humanitarian crisis unfolding in Libya after a major storm unleashed devastating floodwaters. Roughly 5,000 people are feared dead, 10,000 more still unaccounted for. In the coastal city of Derna, the rushing water destroyed two dams, gouging a valley where neighborhoods once stood. And tonight, the need for help is growing. ABC's chief foreign correspondent, Ian Panel, reports. Tonight, catastrophe in Libya. A major storm triggering a flooding disaster, breaking two dams and sweeping away thousands of lives. Officials fear upwards of 5,000 people are dead, with as many as 10,000 still missing. Bodies lining the streets, survivors left with nothing. A quarter of the eastern city of Derna wiped off the map. A Mediterranean storm lashing the coastal city with 16 inches of rain in a 24-hour period. Residents reported sounds like explosions as the massive dams gave way. There used to be a dam, this man says. Now it's soil. Derna City pleading for help. It's taken hours for rescue teams and the military to get on the ground. Conflict and a crumbling infrastructure hampering rescue operations, with Libya divided by two competing governments. As limited international aid arrives, the true scale of this disaster still unknown. So much destruction and now to another story of devastation. The death toll has climbed in the wake of the rare and powerful 6.8 magnitude earthquake that struck Morocco Friday night. More than 2,900 people are confirmed dead. The quake Morocco's strongest in more than a century hit the country's high Atlas mountain range near Marrakesh.
A new storm is triggering flood alerts in the northeast from D.C. to New York all the way up to Boston. It follows a flash flooding emergency in Leominster, Massachusetts, where there were more than nine inches of rain in just a few hours. Hurricane Lee is now a major Category 3 storm. Lee's possible track, those spaghetti models, show it heading north and could make landfall in Maine or near the Canadian border this weekend. ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it all for us. Hey, Rob. Hi, Lindsay. Uh, lots of weather uh, to impact potentially the northeast here. We had a dry day, finally, but flood watches are back up for eastern and central Massachusetts, even southern parts of New Hampshire. So from Boston uh, back to nearly Baltimore, those watches are up till Thursday morning because that front you see slicing across Pennsylvania, that one's strong enough to push through. And as it does so tonight and tomorrow morning from D.C. up by 94.5 and New York and New Haven and eventually towards Providence, we could see strong to severe thunderstorms throughout the day, and those could dump more in the way of some heavy rain. All right, after that, we're looking at Hurricane Lee, which is growing in size. It's a hundred or about 500 miles south of uh, Bermuda. It's got category three force winds. It's forecast to be past Bermuda on Thursday as a cat two, as it does so, churning up water there and along the east coast of the U.S. going to have rip currents and dangerous surf there through the week into the weekend and over the weekend, likely on Saturday, we're looking for a landfall potentially in anywhere from Portland, Maine, through Bar Harbor to Halifax to the eastern edge of Nova Scotia as potentially a category one storm. But even whether or not it's a hurricane or not, it still has a massive wind field that will extend west into the U.S. So I think millions of folks along the New England coast are going to be impacted by Lee before we're done with it. Lindsay. Rob Marciano, our thanks to you as always. Tonight, New York Jets fans are in mourning. Despite the team winning its opening game last night against the Buffalo Bills, four-time MVP Aaron Rodgers' debut with the Jets lasted four snaps. He will now miss the entire season after tearing his Achilles. Stephanie Ramos has more. It was one of the most highly anticipated games. Quarterback Aaron Rodgers making his debut with the New York Jets. But just four plays into the game, it was all over. Down goes Rodgers in the sack for Leonard Floyd. Rodgers going Rams. down on his ankle, tearing his Achilles tendon. And now Rodgers sits down. The quarterback limping off the field. You one. could see the Jordan horror Phillips. on the faces of heartbroken the fans. Second. The Jets' backup quarterback later mounting a surprise comeback to beat the Buffalo Bills. But today, the coach confirming Aaron Rodgers is out for the season. I feel more for Aaron than anyone. He's invested so much into this organization, so much into this journey that he's he's embarked on. The New York debut for the former Green Bay Packer had been hyped for months, seen here in HBO's Hard Knocks. There had been so much hope and faith that Aaron Rodgers would be the messiah for the New York Jets, that he would get them to the Super Bowl. But tonight, the 39-year-old quarterback is facing surgery and months of recovery. He can do it. But it's going to be physically and mentally challenging to get back to the level where he's playing the type of MVP football that he's accustomed to playing. Lindsay, tonight the Jets coach cautioned against riding off the team. He added he has all the faith in the world in quarterback Zach Wilson, who led the team to victory here last night. He says Wilson has made a drastic improvement from a year ago. Lindsay. Stephanie, thank you. Now to Apple's major change. The company revealed its new iPhone and discussed what they've done about those frustrating chargers that change so often. ABC's chief business correspondent, Rebecca Jarvis, joins us now. Becky, what's the change and, and why did Apple decide to make this move? So, Lindsay, there are changes to the cameras in the iPhone 15s, but the change everyone is talking about is the change to the charging port. It is now a USB-C port, meaning it's compatible with other devices like your Mac, your iPad, and even other things like Android's non-Apple phones. This is it. It's hard to see on your screen, but it's a significant change for consumers, and the change wasn't necessarily made because people were clamoring for it here in the U.S. In fact, it is still the number one selling phone in the U.S. The change was made because Apple's hand was forced by European Union regulators who said it had to be changed in order for the company to keep moving forward, Lindsay. All right, Rebecca Jarvis, I guess I'll get rid of all those old chargers I have at home. Thanks so much. <laughs> 
Still much more to get to. Coming up, the CDC director joins us to talk about the plan for new booster shots, how soon they could be available, and whether you should consider masking up again as cases rise. But next, it's a dream for some, but not exactly ideal for one town. What led to hundreds of thousands of gallons of red wine spilling in the streets? Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. And now, an announcement from America's number one most watched morning show. We've got a million good reasons for you to watch GMA this September. Someone somewhere in America is about to get a million dollars live on GMA. Could it be you? Watch GMA this September. Hi, ah, see how I did that? A million good reasons. <laughs> Plus, the new cast of Dancing with the Stars will be revealed live. And the Sharks are back, giving you the real advice to grow <laughs> your money. This September, put some good in your mornings with... Good morning, America! All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. We're coming to you from the top of Carnarvon Castle in Wales. I'm Maggie Rooley. Whatever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. The border between the United States and Mexico is the deadliest land migration route in the world, according to the International Organization for Migration, which tracks deaths and disappearances among migrants. The IOM documented 686 deaths and disappearances among migrants just last year, but the actual figure is likely much higher due to missing data, including the Texas Border County Coroner's Offices and the Mexican Search and Rescue Agency. The son of Myanmar's detained former leader said a deterioration in her mother's health was extremely worrying because she has serious gum disease and is struggling to eat food in prison. The 78-year-old Nobel winner who has been held in jail for more than two years has experienced bouts of dizziness and vomiting but has been denied access to an outside doctor. Rivers of red wine flowed through the streets of Portugal after two tanks burst at a winery. Despite 600,000 gallons of red wine spilling through the streets, there were no reported injuries, and the spillage did trigger an environmental alert. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has endorsed updated COVID shots for everyone aged six months and older. The vaccines from Moderna, Pfizer, and its partner BioNTech will be available by the end of the week. The U.S. has seen a surge in COVID hospitalizations this summer as new variants emerge, with hundreds of people still dying each week. The new shot will be available at pharmacies and some doctor's offices and will be mostly free through private insurance, Medicare, or Medicaid. For more now, let's bring in the director of the CDC, Mandy Cohen. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Great to be with you. Late today, you officially signed off on these booster shots. The shots come as we're, of course, seeing an uptick in COVID cases. How soon will the new shot be available? Well, today, the CDC recommended that everyone should get an updated COVID vaccine. And within the next number of days, you're going to see those start to show up in doctor's offices and pharmacies around the country. Fewer than half of adults older than 65 and just one in five Americans got the booster shot last fall. Many Americans view COVID as a mild threat now. Are you concerned that very few people will opt for boosters this fall? 
Well, we'd all wish for COVID to be in the rear view mirror, but unfortunately it's still here. And what we know is that our immunity decreases over time. So even if you've had COVID before or been vaccinated, that immunity and that protection does decrease over time. Plus what we're seeing is that this virus, the COVID virus continues to change. That's why today the CDC is recommending an updated COVID vaccine for everyone over the age of six months. Again, it's to protect you from the serious consequences that this, this virus still can have. It, many Americans, as you know, have ditched their masks. As we head into the fall and winter, do you see a world where people should mask up again in crowded spaces and inside? Well, as we get to the fall and winter, we're going to have not just COVID circulating, but remember, flu is out there, RSV that impacts our, our young kids is out there, and other viruses. So we want to use all the tools we possibly can to protect ourselves. Vaccine is a great tool, and going into the fall and winter, we have vaccines against all three of those major viruses. So right now, ahead of fall and winter, is a great time for you to get not just your COVID vaccine, but your flu shot, and if you're an older adult, to get an RSV vaccine. Um, but we have to use other tools, right? So if you do get sick, make sure you're getting tested because getting tested allows you to then get treatment and treatment, make sure that you won't get very sick, end up in the hospital. So we need to use all the tools we possibly can to protect ourselves as we get into the fall and winter. Uh, you've just started this job beyond COVID and what we've already discussed with regard to the flu and RSV. Uh, what are your biggest health priorities at the CDC? Well, as you mentioned, you know, first and foremost, we're focused on these respiratory viruses. It's unfortunately the thing that is going to take a number of lives in the coming months, but we have the tools to protect ourselves. So focusing on protecting ourselves from COVID, flu, and RSV is certainly first priority, but many other health threats that are out there. And the CDC is designed to be that um, asset for this country to detect and respond to threats. So other threats like um, declining in our mental health or the opioid crisis that we're seeing, or we're seeing, unfortunately, more suicides. So that is certainly something that we are focused on at the CDC as well, making sure we can bring data and evidence and best practices to support folks, not just with respiratory illnesses, but maybe their mental health um, and addiction as well. And before we let you go, I do want to ask for those who are concerned about the safety, the medical issues potentially down the road that they say they are concerned about with regard to getting these COVID shots, what's your response to those who are still skeptical and doubting? Well, I want folks to know that these vaccines have been studied, frankly, more than any vaccine in history. We've given over 600 million doses of the COVID vaccine. So it's been studied in terms of its safety extensively. Um, so I wouldn't recommend anything I wouldn't recommend for my own family. I'm not just the head of the CDC. I'm, I'm a mom. I'm a wife. I'm a daughter. So you're going to see my 9 and 11-year-old daughters get vaccinated um, with COVID and flu uh, this fall, my husband, my parents. So we're hoping that everyone will protect themselves when we get into the fall and winter, get their updated COVID shot as well as a flu shot. CDC Director Mandy Cohen, we really appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And still to come, what if finally getting a work scenario you've wanted goes from a dream to a nightmare? We talk with the director of the new series, The Other Black Girl. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go, you ready? 
Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Time tonight for the latest in our series, Streamlined, where we bring you some of the biggest films and TV series hitting screens worldwide, speaking with some of the actors and creators behind them. Being the only one in the room is a feeling many people of color have in predominantly white workspaces, but what if finally getting a new coworker only made things worse? That's the theme explored in the new Hulu thriller, The Other Black Girl. Let's take a look. Pack your books. Hello, yes. Nella? Will you get me another coffee? Nella? Will you get Advil for me? Nella? Will you get Nella? Nella? I need you to Nella. 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 There's someone you have to meet. This is Hazel Mae McCall, my new assistant. Really? Hi. We are joined now by the director of several episodes in the series, Mariama Diallo. Mariama, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. This series is based on the 2021 book by the same name. What about the book made you realize, man, this would be great for TV? Well, um, you know, I was fortunate to be a huge fan of the book before I had any involvement with the show. I read it for fun um, months before uh, coming onto the project, and I just found it so immensely relatable. And, um, you know, I live in Brooklyn. Um, I have certainly been in some of the uh, scenarios that Nella has been in. Fortunately, not some of the more uh, negative ones. And I just, I was excited about Zakia's voice, Zakia being the author. And I was really curious about what the world of the story would look like on the screen. It, readers sometimes do get anxious when their favorite book becomes a movie or a TV show. What was the process like adapting the book to a TV series? Um, you know, it is it is definitely a delicate um, line to toe when you're adapting from book to the screen. Fortunately, we had the author, Zakia Delila Harris, involved in every step of the way. Um, she was one of the head writers. Um, of the project, and so we really leaned on her as uh, you know, as our guiding star in um, translating the story to the screen. And having said that, we had a little bit of freedom to take uh, the show in directions that weren't necessarily explored in the book. And we also, you know, we had the blessing to explore different. Um, different aspects than uh, what is literally on the page of the novel. The Other Black Girl is about office culture, which is complicated for everyone, some would argue, especially for black women. As a director, how do you tell that story and it, at the same time explain the complexities of these experiences? You know, it's, it's interesting because you don't want to create something that's completely dry. But for me, what was very important was that uh, despite integrating some mystery and suspense elements, that the core of the story felt incredibly true to life. And in telling this office story and the story of a Black woman with professional ambitions that are being uh, kind of ambushed, uh, I, I really leaned on my actors. We really looked into their performances and tried to dig into the reality of their own lived experiences and also try to find the authentic emotions behind some of uh, the scenarios that our characters find themselves in. And many of the themes surrounding race and gender in this series are certainly relatable, but for others, these themes might feel brand new. Uh, what do you hope that people will ultimately take away from this show? You know, I think that it's always a little bit of a complicated question um, to wonder um, or to hope for audiences to derive a specific message. I think that one of the most exciting uh, things that I can do as a creator and as a filmmaker is to provide 
an audience with an experience that feels in some way authentic, that feels real, that feels emotionally engaging, and then give them uh, the space to come to their own conclusions. But certainly something that was really important to all of us on the creative team was making the character of Nella feel nuanced and real, making her journey and her struggles and her anxieties really resonate with viewers um, and, and bring to the fore uh, perhaps some issues or some concerns or some questions that they've had in their own lives. So I, I would hope that viewers are able to get uh, a lot and connect to uh, Nella's character in particular. Mariama Diallo, we thank you so much for coming on the show. The Other Black Girl premieres on Hulu tomorrow. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. The news never stops. Have a great night. This is ABC News Live. The crush of the family.